Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to the first COVID-19 update, health, public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. I'm Lorna Vigili, Public Information Officer, and Happy New Year to all of you. Today, we are joined by, doc, by Dr. Earl Stotter, who is Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, as well as our Acting Health Officer, Dr. James Bridgers, and Sean O'Donnell, Program Administrator with Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response for the Department of Health and Human Services. As always, members of the media, if you do not have permission to report, please use the chat and let us know. And I'm gonna to toss it to you, Mr. County Executive. Happy New Year, and how are you feeling today? Uh, how am I feeling today? I'm feeling better than I did yesterday. Yesterday was um, a little better than the day before. I'd say the day before was the most unpleasant day. I had a serious sore throat, and yesterday it was a mild sore throat, and today it's a little bit of a sore throat. Um, but I've managed to be mostly without a fever through this whole thing. And uh, the other big thing is waves of fatigue, where all you can do is put your head down and go to sleep, and you can't even argue with yourself if you're going to stay awake. It's like you are going to sleep now. Um, those have been the big things. Um, I feel, you know, pretty fortunate. Um, but having a sore throat and a cough, is, it's not the biggest thing. Uh, uh, the rest of my household is mostly recovered. We all got vaccinated and boosted. But as we're seeing so often around the country and around the county, um, that, you know, this has not fully protected us from this highly contagious variant of the coronavirus. And I'm grateful that we all avoided the symptoms, the severe symptoms and the hospitalization. And frankly, for that, we have the vaccines to thank. Um, my situation reinforces, I think, the reality on the ground that if you're vaccinated and boosted, you're much less likely to get seriously sick and end up in a hospital. New data from the University of Maryland Medical System shows that over the past 30 days, 74% of their hospitalized COVID cases were unvaccinated. 24% were fully vaccinated, but, and this is very important, just 2% were boosted. And the latest analysis from the state's lab partner shows that 88.5% of recently analyzed samples tested positive for Omicron. And of samples that from the hospitalized COVID patients, 91% had, had the Omicron variant. So, you know, the very small portion of our population, which is unvaccinated, contributes disproportionately to the hospitalizations and the cases. Um, it's true, absolutely, there are breakthroughs, but the breakthroughs do not produce the same kind of illness that you get when you are unvaccinated. So I think the message um, that we've been giving out has kind of been proven by what how this is playing out. It certainly, in my own personal experience, it kind of matches my experiences. Um, yesterday, Larry Hogan uh, declared a 30-day state of emergency following the urgings from the head of the Maryland Hospital Association and myself, Association and from myself over the past week, and I want to thank him for taking this step. Um, the governor said his decision was made to alleviate pressure on the state's hospitals, which are being overwhelmed with an increase in COVID-related hospitalizations and an increase in deaths. The state hit a record high in hospitalizations this week, and projections show that it could still go significantly higher in the rest of this month. Um, the hospitals are also hit with staffing issues. We know they had staffing issues before Omicron started spreading like crazy, um, but they've had even more staffing issues as more of their folks are getting sick and unable to come to work. So um, they're getting hit on both ends with a higher patient load and with more people in, in the professions they rely on winding up getting sick, which is not exactly surprising working in a hospital. Uh, the governor's declaration is serious business, and I hope it's a wake up call for the unvaccinated and unboosted. <clears throat> and I hope it uh, demonstrates the importance of following common sense precautions, namely wearing a mask, avoiding crowds, and regularly washing hands. We need to slow the spread of this disease, and I'm asking the governor to implement a statewide indoor mask mandate as we have here. I appreciate the county council's action yesterday to maintain the mask mandate at least till the end of January. And I think it would have been irresponsible to end the mandate at this time when we're seeing our highest rates of spread. 
I want to remind everybody that, you know, the focus on mask mandates is not to close business. It's actually to keep businesses open. We're trying to make the spaces that everybody wants to return to as safe as possible. But if we can keep them as safe as possible and minimize the spread, which admittedly is way more challenging with Omicron, but to the extent this has an effect in minimizing the spread, it is having a positive effect on the community in general, but also on the hospitals, which are gonna to have to manage the spread that's gonna come. So it makes a difference in how fast COVID spreads and the masks simply help keep us safer. Um, businesses can continue pretty much to operate as they've been operating. Um, in terms of case rates, according to MDH, our positivity rate today is 26.78. This is the highest positivity rate our county has experienced since the beginning of the pandemic. We also have a case rate of over 1,800 COVID cases for 100,000 residents over the last seven days. <clears throat> to put this last number into perspective, this is five times higher than our case rate peak, which occurred during last winter's surge of cases. So that's a huge change in cases per 100,000. And again, I go back to those brief week or two in the middle of the summer when we actually thought this was over. And we were looking at COVID cases per 100,000 on the order of four or five. Now it's 1,800. So it's obviously a serious and it needs to be treated like it's serious. It's a crisis and there's no dressing it up. We're treating as such in this county with projections that this surge will extend into next month. The Montgomery County government has taken a three-pronged approach. We are stepping up testing. We're doubling down on our efforts to get residents vaccinated and boosted. We're continuing to aggressively reach out and get those folks who haven't received their boosters to come in and get their boosters and to continue to appeal to the residents who haven't been vaccinated to please come in and get vaccinated. And we're doing what we can to mitigate community spread. We recorded highs in the amount of tests we administered last week from our HHS testing locations. And amongst all of our county test providers, we are now testing three times as many people <clears throat> as we did at the height of the Delta variant surge. Um, and there's good news is that we've, re uh, we've ordered a million home-based test kits, um, rapid test kits. The first 196,000 kits arrived yesterday. We're expecting another 196,000 to arrive tomorrow, but the first shipment we delivered to the MCPS warehouse, 100,000 tests for them to distribute, <clears throat> and another 90,000 will be delivered to MCPS warehouse from tomorrow's delivery. The remaining kits are gonna be distributed to the public via our community partners, high exposure risk settings, and distribution sites. We expect to use our libraries for distribution, and we'll have additional details about specific branches and times over the next couple of days. In, as part of the increased vaccination efforts, the very best way we can reduce the enormous stress being placed on hospitals right now is to continue to get vaccinated and boosted. And I cannot emphasize this enough. <clears throat> if you want a sobering statistic and look at the chart um, of COVID-19 deaths, and if, if you take the deaths in Montgomery County, just the last box there. Between December and January to date, Montgomery County's experienced 35 deaths. That is roughly 4% of the state's total deaths. We're close to 20% of the state's population. The state had um, 733 deaths in December and January. We had 35. Do the math. If you don't think being tested doesn't have a difference, doesn't play a role in this and doesn't make a difference, think about Montgomery County's numbers. Think about the numbers in most of the rest of the state. It actually matters whether you're vaccinated or not. So please pay attention to this. Our county's vaccination rate is among the highest, not just in the state, but also in the country. We're seeing just how effective it is in protecting us against severe illness and deaths. And uh, this is our chart on vaccinations to date. We're up to 83.5% fully vaccinated, 88.9% <clears throat> of the population over five years old, 94.5% the with the population over 12. 
<coughs> excuse me, the 94.6 with a population 18 years and older and 95% with a population over 65. According to the CDC, our county is 83%, 83.5% fully vaccinated, but it does not include a booster. And we'll have more on that. Uh, we're pretty sure that the guidance is going to change to adding the booster as a definition to the definition of what means fully vaccinated. And in that regard, we're lagging. We need to get the booster shots done. Data shows we still have 55% um, of our eligible pop population who can get boosted. And I encourage anyone who's eligible to sign up immediately. Unlike testing, where we do have long lines and booked appointments and limited supplies, we have plenty of vaccines. And you will find you can simply walk into most pharmacies and vaccine locations and find the vaccine shot or booster. Just this week, the FDA expanded emergency use of Pfizer boosters for children 12 to 15. Also reduced the length of time a person needed to wait after receiving the initial series of shots from six months to five months for everyone 12 and older. And our health team is awaiting guidance from the state to begin that process. Um, I'll say that we're better prepared than we were in previous surges for the simple reason that we have already been there. I'm hopeful, for instance, that we won't have to limit indoor capacity or shut down our schools so long as we can continue to increase our vaccination and boosting rates. As for our public venues, last week I submitted legislation to the County Council to implement a vaccination passport program for restaurants, entertainment outlets, and gyms. I believe this will actually help businesses during the surge, not only, not only easing concerns of the patrons, but also limiting the potential that someone might become sick and perhaps hospitalized and hurting the reputation of that business. Um, people want to be in a place that's safe, and we think uh, this is one way to help encourage people to feel safer in these environments. I want to acknowledge that our Montgomery County Public Schools are working to balance keeping as many of our schools open as possible while also juggling this outbreak. I know how difficult this is for parents, teachers, staff, and students. Um, for parents, sending your child off to school at a time like this has brought, um, for some people, tremendous anxiety. And for others, there's tremendous anxiety in navigating the world of virtual learning with a son or daughter. Um, I see this in my emails. I, see it from both sides. There are large numbers of people <clears throat> who feel pretty strongly that either one of these paths is not the right path. And there are frankly only two paths. So we're doing the best to manage it. And I appreciate the school system uh, continuing to work at maintaining the schools as open as possible while controlling the spread of COVID. It's going to be a bumpy time and we're trying to help our schools balance preserving in-person learning with managing the consequences of the Omicron surge. I'm confident that the additional testing that we're able to get a hold of is going to help the school system manage this going forward. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe the school system is going to be ordering the N95, KN95 masks for the children. And so they'll also be improving the level of mask wearing in the schools. Uh, I want to just make a quick note about snow patrol and a non-COVID happening. I think we all experienced the first snow of the season and we're you know, kind of surprised. I wasn't expecting a snowstorm in January, particularly after a 70 degree day, a day or two before the snowstorm. Um, but it was one of the most significant snowfalls in recent years. I want to thank our cleanup crews and the contractors from MCDOT for doing a great job of clearing our roads and sidewalks throughout the county. This is not an easy job, and we appreciate their hard work, their professionalism, and their dedication to safety. I also want to thank HHS for keeping our COVID testing sites opened on Monday. With the state sites closed, this effort was much appreciated by our residents who are in great need of getting tested. We are still in the early days of the winter season. Here's hoping that if another snow occurs, we can get through this without incident. And I just thank you again for tuning in, bearing with my somewhat gravelly voice. And I will turn it over to Dr. Bridgers, um, Sean O'Donnell, and Dr. Stoddard. Good afternoon, all, and Happy New Year. And thank you, Mr. County Executive, for inviting me to participate in your weekly uh, press conference. Just a couple of updates, uh, really quick updates <clears throat> regarding our uh, the CDC's 
our most recent um, isolation and quarantine guidance. We are crafting policy, which mirrors that guidance uh, as we await for uh, the Maryland Department of Health. Um, recommendations <clears throat> as they uh, interpret the guidance as well. Um, our guidance will allow uh, individuals on day five to uh, recommend that they uh, receive a test as well as uh, consistently and constantly wear a mask um, on the remaining days uh, as set forth by the CDC. Uh, we will have a meeting this afternoon with the Maryland Department of Health to uh, address those recommendations and see if they uh, add to our uh, proposed uh, policy to the county executive and others. Uh, lastly, we will be meeting with MCPS this evening to look at those recommendations again to see how it applies to K through 12 and child care settings and most recently as Mr. Elrich indicated how it impacts those schools that are either uh, will be transitioned to a virtual platform or those individuals um, that it may impact uh, along the current uh, outbreak uh, quarantine uh, set forth by the Maryland Department of Health based on those 14 calendar days. And we will be assessing and addressing those and the impact of the new CDC guidelines. I'll stop there and turn it over to Mr. O'Donnell uh, for his quick updates on uh, the county metrics. Thank you, Dr. Bridgers. Um, just going to move through this rather quickly today. And um, oh, sorry. I'm not sure why you are seeing uh, the pulse report, Tom. Are you seeing the pulse report now? Yes. Okay. Um, all right then. So uh, again, we, as as the uh, county executive has uh, shared with you all, we are seeing very high transmission rates. Um, and this is resulting in high utilization of our hospitals. 31% uh, of our hospital beds uh, have COVID patients in them uh, currently. Uh, this is having a, um, an impact on our hospitals, even with the increased uh, physical capacity that has been developed over the past two years. Um, the, the staffing capacity has been impacted in the other direction. As we know, many healthcare individuals have left uh, the field, um, and this, is, this has caused a lot of challenges. Uh, again, the emergency order should help um, uh, our hospitals with bringing additional staff on um, per the emergency order. Uh, as to the, the total number of, of COVID patients in hospitals, uh, we are now at 459. This changes. This has been changing very um, significantly each day. Uh, 315 of those are in acute care beds. Uh, 74 have been at the alternate care center, and uh, 70 are uh, uh, intensive care unit patients with COVID diagnoses. Um, again, we're we're concerned with these increasing numbers um, and specifically, of course, with those with the most severe illness in the ICU. We, uh, as the state data feeds have come back online, um, we've been able to get uh, better information um, about uh, total vaccinations that are occurring across the county. And um, we have now updated our charts with our first dose rates. Um, again, we're tracking these geographically in biracial and ethnic um, background. And um, we have seen uh, that there has been some uh, differences in the uh, overall representation of uh, first dose rates. And some of this is with our five to 11 uh, year olds coming out for first doses. So we will continue to work with our, 
our partners um, with the um, Montgomery County Public Schools as far as trying to target uh, vaccination clinics in those areas with uh, lower vaccination rates. Uh, and we are now looking at doing um, a combination pediatric and, and adult booster shots at those clinics um, going forward. Uh, just looking at where our pediatric rates are, since this is the newest group of, of, of individuals who are eligible for vaccination, um, we are, uh, again, just a little over 50% with first doses and um, about 35% fully vaccinated. Um, we're still strongly, strongly encouraging parents to bring their kids out to get vaccinated. Um, we realize that the, the previous few weeks have been very, very busy weeks. We also know that uh, individuals, um, many people have been sick and uh, the, the wait time from um, an illness to when you're eligible to get vaccinated is very, very similar to the isolation period. Essentially, it's when, you're, when your uh, symptoms have resolved um, and you've cleared the isolation period. So it's about 10 days. Um, so we know some people are waiting uh, for that uh, to recover from an illness, um, that, but we still encourage them to come out both uh, in the pediatric or young children who haven't been vaccinated yet, as well as our um, older children and adults who are looking for a booster. And um, finally, just to talk about our distribution of rapid testing, uh, we, we just wanted to share that um, we're not only sharing these out through our uh, school partners, our MCPS school partners, but we will be going um, and designating some to go out through our community partners who are helping us get these to harder to reach populations. And um, ultimately, we're working with our library partners on a distribution system. They're not at the libraries at the moment. Please don't uh, go out there looking for rapid tests. We will have updated information when these are available. Um, we'll also have an online portal to report your rapid test results, whether you get them from the county or, or someplace else. Um, we wanna make it easy for individuals to report their results and for public health to follow up. Um, that's all I have, but uh, um, we're happy to answer any questions. Dr. Stoddard? I'll, I'll make no opening, we keep us on time. And I'll answer questions. All righty. Uh, let's get started with uh, questions from the members of the media. Remember to use the chat to ask permission to ask a question. And I see that Kate Ryan is number one with WTOP. Good afternoon, Kate. Hey, hope it, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. So uh, in, I'm going to jump on the last thing that we just saw, 396,000 tests. These are the rapid antigen tests that people are looking for. Um, 100,000 go to the schools of the first shipment. How will those be distributed within the schools? I know there was discussion yesterday when council member Jawando said, why not do an opt out uh, so that parents don't have to scramble running around for tests, then document them, then make sure they get uh, recorded because a lot of parents are finding this very confusing. What's happening there? And secondly, on a mass, testing site. Uh, do we have one yet? What are the plans there? And how does that mix with the rapid antigen tests? I, I can update you on, uh, I'll start in reverse. Um, we have had, uh, we've had discussions yesterday. We're moving rapidly uh, with these, with our state partners. They did respond to the county's request for additional testing support. And um, we are, we, in our discussions, uh, we are looking at moving very quickly on this. We're hoping to have a, the, an additional testing site open in the Germantown area operated by our, our state partners um, as early as next week. Um, we are, uh, we'll, we'll continue to work with them. We believe it's going to be seven days, um, but they are, they're moving their um, resources very quickly. Um, and this may be supported by the National Guard on, with our, um, is the understanding that we have. Um, one of the key objectives is to try to reduce the number of people who are going to our hospital emergency departments for testing. And again, we wanna reiterate, if the only thing you need is a test, do not go to the hospital emergency departments, please. Um, as, far as, 
as far as the, the second one, um, I think some of my colleagues uh, may have some information about on that, but I don't believe you need to opt in to receive a rapid test from MCPS. Yeah, Sean's correct on that point. So the school system will handle the distribution within their own system. We drop them off their warehouse. It's obviously their job to get them the last mile from the warehouse to the individual schools. They're going to distribute them, rec recognizing that 100,000 arrived today, another 90,000 will arrive to them, presumably on uh, Thursday or Friday. You'll have to distribute the remainder there. Uh, my understanding is they'll prioritize schools that are in the, particularly in the yellow, obviously to try and, you know, you know those are places where there's increased risk. Uh, but also that they are going to prioritize Title I schools. That was a discussion we had with them earlier this week. And so I would expect that you're going to see uh, prioritizations that look like that, but it'll be up to them to determine exactly how, which schools get how many and where and all those details. I believe that's something that they're working on internally that we are not, we, we've given them some guidance, but they're specifically working on the distribution uh, plan for in, inside the system. And a quick follow-up. The governor this morning said he's working on getting more tests. He mentioned the 500,000 and an additional 500,000 that he has tried to get out. Can you talk about the level of distribution of those? And th that this harks back to, I think, the, the first deliveries that came in November, right? That you were getting 2,500 a week. How, how, what's the status now? We, um, we, we continue to try to communicate with our, our state partners to uh, to get a better idea of how many are coming in. Um, it did get uh, the most recent shipment. They come every two weeks and the most recent shipment went from 5,000 uh, to closer to 10,000. Um, so that, that's why we're, we're doing the estimate of about 2,500 to 5,000 a week. Um, our understanding is we'll continue to receive these every other week. Um, but again, this is a, while this is a, a we very much appreciate these kits coming in. And for a while, it was the majority of what we had. Um, you know, there's, we'd still welcome um, a, a greater number of these. I know the demand is out there right now. I think the state has given us certainly less than 30,000 test kits in total the, of the home-based kits. I wanna make sure that we need to clearly distinguish between what kinds of kits we get. There's a lot of clinical kits that are the larger boxes that have to be administered on site. The take-home kits, I think we've received fewer than 30,000. Is that an accurate number, Sean? Yeah. Uh, and obviously DC has given that out on a good day. So, it, you know, it's just, a, it's a, that's why we went out and made our own purchases because we appreciate this for the state, but it was, it was just wholly insufficient for the need within our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Next up is Steve Bonnell, Bethesda Beat. Good afternoon, Steve. Happy New Year. Um, so about the distribution at libraries upcoming, um, you know, one of the things that was interesting to see when other jurisdictions locally were doing this was there was a there was a run on tests, a lot of people standing in line. So I'm wondering, uh, I'm guessing households are going to be limited to how many they can pick up at libraries once you have that set up. I guess I'll just start there. Yeah, our intention is to limit it in the same way that I mean, we, we, we're going to probably model ourselves right after DC. I think they do two per two per household. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, you know, we'll we'll make the same uh, specific direction around focusing on Montgomery County residents only, um, and then there'll be a, it'll be a distribution from there. Uh, look, there's no way of getting around the fact that there's a lot of need and a desire to have these kits. And um, when we make them available through libraries, I expect you're going to see long lines because people will want these commodities. Uh, we're going to make them available as quickly and, and as great a number as we possibly can over multiple days and multiple times throughout the day. We're not going to limit it to just daytime people who can come during the day. We're not going to limit it to just people who can come during the night. We're not going to limit it to weekdays and not weekends. And so we're going to work on a pretty broad distribution. And I expect it to start pretty soon. I'm not, I don't think you're going to be hearing that we're starting in two weeks. I think you're going to hear hearing us over the next couple of days announcing when we're going to be starting and um, make them as broadly as available as possible. But I, but I fully expect that you will be reporting on the first few days that we gave the kits out in an hour or something. And then, you know, um, or, or there was a line of 150 or 300 people at some locations. I, I, I expect that to happen because of the interest. But our goal is to have these as frequently as possible, make them available through methods beyond just the library system, get them out through their community partners to people who can't come into the library system. And then obviously getting them out through, you know, MCPS. We're trying to make a, a, a plethora of different opportunities for people to get these kits available to them. 
such that we can really quickly get through that phase of where they're viewed as a commodity where people will, will camp out for them essentially and where we'll make it more, more normal for people just to have them in their house and available to them should they feel that they need to use them. I know you guys have been doing a lot of stuff during the whole pandemic through an equity framework being the buzz phrase. How might that work with libraries? I imagine that you know, is it going to be an equal amount of tests for all libraries? I imagine it won't be that way, but correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I think the the, the issue with libraries will be more the, the the physical footprint of the library, which will direct a lot of the pacing, meaning how quickly we can flow people through and hand them out. Obviously, some of the larger libraries have a have a you know more open space that they can we can wrap we can wrap people through pretty quickly, and so there will be. So, so really with our equity framework, the way we've really tried to address that is by actually front loading the kits on with our minority health partnerships, with our community groups, the groups that are really serving our most at need populations are already receiving rapid test kits and they'll continue to receive them in, in larger quantities through this process. And so with the library system, that's really the shotgun element of the approach, which is to get as many out to as many people as possible. And so the, the specific element of the library is not going to it's equitably designed because libraries are equitably, equitably distributed throughout the county, but it's not going to be the same. We're going to have targeted efforts to try and get the people who, uh, who are not able to come out to a library. And, and really the, the library effort is a much just broader, get as many kids out as possible effort. I guess when they're going to you know, mention other community partners, just for my sake and our readers sake, more specifically nonprofits, you know, Specifically, where are those tests going? As simple as that sounds. John, you want to look? Yeah, I think you. I think you're. Yeah, you're well, most right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But like you know, uh, cheer um, the minority health initiatives. Um, right. Sean, I think you. I was just trying to kill some time while you're. While yeah. you're up. Care for you yeah. other other community-based organizations under our, our safety net. Um, our Montgomery Cares Clinic. Sean, you want to go through the list for Steve? Yeah, Steve. I'm sorry. I'm. I was just uh, trying to make sure I pulled this up, having a little trouble with my computer today. Um, so we, we actually have a, there's a bit more extensive group of this. Um, we work with, a, obviously being a health and human services agency, we work with a lot of programs that are able to uh, connect with individuals who receive our services. Um, and both through those, through community hubs, through uh, food distribution centers, um, as well as, again, our, our primary care coalition partners. We've distributed uh, tests out through them and to get out to the communities that they serve. Um, we also, when we've been doing homebound booster vaccinations, um, we've been delivering um, kits out there. I know uh, we did receive some phone calls um, from people who were homebound asking for, uh, for who were not looking for vaccinations, just asking for test kits. Um, we're we're uh, documenting those and trying to get back in touch with them. Um, it was hitting us right at a point where we were um, uh, at a resource crunch because of, of COVID spreading throughout our staff, um, but we are going to try to follow up and get tests out to those groups as well. Um, so again, as these tests come in, we're going to keep trying to have them go out uh, through multiple different means uh, to get to the public. Um, I know there's, again, there's just huge demand for it. Um, and we're, we're going to try to be able to um, uh, meet as many people's needs as we can. And the theme of paying attention cl more close to the sites, do you know how many tests are going out to libraries roughly? Or is that still TBD? Um, it's or, TBD, Yo, uh, go ahead, Sean. No, I'm sorry, it, go, go ahead. I was just going to say you're on mute. Oh, yeah. So um, so right now, I mean, without going into too many details, we're going to have specific hours at each location that vary. There, you know, we're going to start out, the way we're going to start out is we're going to, we're, we're going to base the number around the time frame. So hypothetically speaking, if they're open for three hours, we'll probably give them something like 500 kits. Okay. Uh, this site will get 500 kits to give out. Okay, that was day one. Did, did How quickly did they give out those kits? Were they able to get through all 500 in three hours or did they get through 500 in an hour and a half? okay, let's increase the amount of kits they have for the next day. And so it will, we aren't going to have a shortage of kits in the short term. As we said, we're going to have, you know, you take the 190-ish thousand that we are receiving by tomorrow or 390-ish thousand that we're receiving tomorrow 
take 190,000 and give them to MCPS. So we have 200,000 kits to distribute through this and other mechanisms. We've got several weeks worth of kits to distribute, so at least at least two weeks worth of kits to distribute, and we're expecting more shipments to come in. And so we shouldn't be limited necessarily by the volume. It's more, you know, how quickly can we get them out there, number one. But number two, it's still, we have to have staff to give them out. We have to make sure that the sites can withstand the, the crush of people that we expect to get them. And so we're trying to design this in a way that people are not going to be super frustrated by the process, that they can be in all the communities. And so we'll, we're going to, we, we're probably going to start with a number of like 500 over three hours as a ballpark. It may, it may be slightly higher or slightly lower, depending on the footprint of a specific building. We're working on the planning in the background to, to specific specific to that, but then it will quickly modulate based on what we're able to actually give out in various settings, how successful certain sites are as, as, as at proven flow. And those sites will naturally get more test kits because we have them to get out. Oh, thank you, everyone. All righty, thank you so much, Steve. Next up is Randy Bass, WDVM. Good afternoon, Randy. Good afternoon. Happy New Year, everyone, and, and well wishes to you, Mr. County Executive. Hope you feel better soon. Uh, quick question. Um, Mr. O'Donnell said all these hospitals that are already overrun with patients are seeing people come in for non-emergencies like seeking out tests. But earlier this week, Hogan announced that the National Guard is supposed to help stand up these hospital adjacent test sites. Have you heard anything about the potential for one of these sites to come to a Montgomery County hospital and do you know anything about the time frame for operations like that? And that is that is uh, exactly what I was referring to um, with our discussions with the state uh, with regards to an additional testing site in the Germantown area. Um, this is uh, the the goal was specifically to reduce the um, the pressure that the the hospitals are seeing in their emergency departments. And so this will likely be. Um, uh, not far away from um, our, our hospitals up there. And is it your understanding that the county will need to be involved in trying to stand up these test sites or is this mostly just going to be a state operation? Well, I, you know, we're supporting them with the, the planning and, um, and the guidance. Uh, we'll, I would imagine we're going to list them on our county website um, and that way we can connect people to the, the resource. Um, and again, we've we've had a good partnership um, in the past with the state. Uh, they did indicate that they'll bring the the staffing, which is a critical piece of it, um, and they'll uh, likely be able to set up their their operation there. But you know, this is is something that we've partnered with other um, private and and um, public entities to ensure that they can successfully uh, test the residents of Montgomery County um, at the level we expect and and get results back to them. So. Thanks for clarifying. And in addition to libraries and potentially now hospitals, do you see any other venues that might be a good opportunity to use to distribute test kits? We're certainly looking at a few. I had a meeting with Fire Rescue about how how, the, how they could help support us with distribution. And while we don't want to use firehouses for obvious reasons in terms of debilitating those, they would they are interested in helping support and maybe having a different locations. We're looking at a couple other options for other places. Our goal is to ultimately make these, they will be viewed as a commodity in the beginning. There will be lines of people, but ultimately our goal is to use a shotgun approach to get them out into the community as much as possible, which will obviously reduce the burden at the PCR-based uh, sites that we or the state operate. And also it allows people to make a, a quicker decision about whether they need to self-quarantine or not because the rapid test obviously gives you a result in 15 minutes. So. Uh, yes, I would expect there will be more opportunities for, for the community to get them and we're going to expand, at, you know, we'll start off with a certain number of libraries and expand and expand and other facilities and things like that. The goal is to make them as widely available as possible with as little, little um, you know, uh, personal investment from a resident and having to wait to get them. Thank you all for letting me ask those questions. I see Kate kind of asked a, a piggyback follow-up question off of my question. I'll, I'll ask it for her from the chat. It's it's a great question. Are there the tests that they're going to use for those hospital sites going to be tests that come from the state or are those gonna come from the million or so tests that you all have already ordered? No, that, that's a good question. That was the first thing we asked. Um, and they indicated it would come from uh, the state supplies. And my understanding is that would be, that they would be um, PCR tests. Again, this is this is all rapidly moving. We appreciate the the speed at which they're they're working, 
And um, we have more conversations planned with them later this afternoon and uh, potentially with a, a location um, with the site and with the hospital. So um, hopefully we'll have more information very soon. But to answer your question, yes, I, I believe it, these will come from out of the state supplies of tests and I believe there'll be PCR tests. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Randy. Uh, Kate Ryan, Randy asked you a question, but I did see that you have some other questions in the back. Are you good? I just, I wanted to follow up on the, oh, there is a, a last question I had. In, um, when some people are heading to these sites, uh, particularly Spanish speakers, I'm hearing from the community that there are those who may not have the literacy skills. It's not just the language skills, but telling people to go to a website may not be helpful. I'm hearing from some segments of the community. How do you, and I acknowledge the challenge, how do you help get tests in the hand of those community members who may not be able to follow through on a, on a website or understand what's on the web? So Kate, I can speak to some of that. Good. I mean, you know, Dr. I've answered enough, you go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> so, so in order to address any, any literacy uh, challenges that we have, we have interpreters on site, we have um, a multilingual documentation, we have folks to actually be there to um, um, respond and answer questions to make folks uh, to have the procedures and, and, and applications understandable. Um, we also uh, have engaged our minority partners um, across our uh, uh, multicultural groups to support our efforts in some instances, they are specific to um, uh, their uh, support uh, population. And we continue to look at ways to increase the literacy and response to reduce any hesitancy to get folks either to get tested or boosted or vaccinated. I'd like to add one point to that. And that is with regard to the take home rapid tests, and we will have, we're, going, we're building a portal just like similar to what DC has done for reporting your test results. To me, that is a secondary issue, meaning people who have home rapid tests, the most important thing is that they're utilizing them to test and then acting accordingly to the results that they receive. Yes, we want people to report, and that is an important element to it to understand where cases are and what, what's happening in our community. But the most important element is that people have the tests in their hands, can run them, and can utilize those results to make decisions that reduce the risk that they pose to others and that they how they can safely proceed throughout their lives. And so while we will have a reporting system, I think the most important thing is that people have the ability to receive and utilize the tests. And if they if they have struggles reporting, and in some cases, we're gonna try and address those, but so long as they act, they receive the kits, use the kits and act on the results, I think we've done the, we've done a great service regardless of the reporting piece. Thank you. Can, can I ask on that though? Do we then assume that we are underreporting some of yes. these? Oh, 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 yes. We are underreporting a great number of cases in Montgomery County, across the state, and across the country. I mean, we're going to be providing these rapid tests free of charge, but there. I mean, I have you know, I have test results in my house. I mean, I have, we have tested positive, but obviously we have test kits in our house that we've run and tested negative many times, and not necessarily reported every one of those. And so I think it is. Uh, yes, there are tons of tests that have been available that people have purchased online or other places. They haven't been equitably available to everyone, but there have certainly been many rapid tests that are assuredly not being reported through any system right now. Thank you very much. And thank you, Randy. Thank you, Kate. Uh, next up, Mariam Shahzad, my MCM. Good afternoon, Mariam. Hello, hello, good afternoon. Um, just quickly jumping back to the new CDC guidance. Um, Dr. Bridgers, I know you said the county and the state, you're currently reviewing that. Do you know when the county and also MCPS might update their guidance to reflect that? And then also just for now, could you clarify what the guidance is? Thank you. Sure, so great much. question, Marianne. Um, we are working with uh, MDH. I have a, media, a meeting immediately following this to look at the CDC guidelines, but basically what it means is that CDC proposed the uh, shortened isolation and quarantine uh, practice uh, to include five days and then five additional days for consistent and constant mask wearing. We are recommending that a uh, test uh, be conducted, a rapid test uh, be conducted uh, on day five for those individuals um, uh, leaving isolation or quarantine, but 
added uh, preventative measures to consistently and constantly wear a mask during the remaining period, those five days, those additional days. Uh, I haven't received any additional information. There's a discussion regarding what uh, the Maryland Department of Health's interpretation of that and the Maryland State Department of Education uh, interpretation of that and how, will, and how it will apply in K through 12 and child care settings. And so we're working on that now. We've drafted a policy uh, that mirrors CDC and we will update it and include any additional information that the Maryland Department of Health or the Maryland State Department of Education has to um, uh, uh, embellish those policy recommendations. I'll just add a couple of points. I think, and I think Dr. Bridges will mess with a little bit, but I want to make sure it's key. We talked this morning, I think, we, we both agree, and certainly all the team agrees, that having a rapid test on the back end of that five-day period, particularly as we talk about isolation, is a, is a really, really good, I, I think CDC called it best approach, but didn't require it, in part because of some weird uh, use, use of FDA approvals as a justification not to have it as a requirement. I, I, you know, I think that's a, sort of an uh, unusual distinction to draw. Uh, in terms of the way the tests actually work, I think having a test run at the end of the five-day period of isolation is a great way to do it. I said this online yesterday, and I stand by that. But I will say that the CDC clarification that came yesterday came with some additional stipulations that have real operational issues. For example, it says you should not do things where you're eating in close proximity to other people, for example. So obviously, you can imagine that has huge implications for how you administer this program in a school setting, for example. Uh, are you going to have students who are coming back from illness go eat in a separate space? What does that mean? Or how are they how are they viewed by their schoolmates then? Like we have to talk through all of these issues with MCPS to make sure that when when we have when we, we implement a change or when we implement a change or what change we implement can obviously not just follow the science of yes you can return five days after with a, with presumably a negative rapid test, but also how do you follow the rest of that guidelines with regard to face face mask wearing? Uh, in a setting that kids have to eat at school, for example, um, or correction, uh, you know, in a correctional setting or in a, you know, a different, in, in different congregate settings, how do you apply those things? Uh, that's why I think we want the state guidance to come out and, and, and provide us information like that. But also we need to meet with all the partners and understand the individual implications of the change. I think we're inclined to make a change in this space based on the state guidance and the CDC guidance. We just need to make sure that we're operationally able to implement all elements of the CDC recommendation. You good, Moran? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, it's uh, Glynis Kazanyan, ABC7. Good afternoon, Glynis. Good, af good afternoon, thank you, Lorna. A um, couple of quick follow-up questions, please. Are the libraries that are going to be selected for the rapid test distribution going to be select locations? I'm assuming it's not going to be every library in Montgomery County. That's one question. My other question is, I just wanted to confirm, I, I got confused. Will there be PCR tests only at this Germantown site that's supposed to open up next week, or is it just rapid tests or both, please? For the, for the Germantown site, I, I um, I'll probably have more information later today on on the specifics. Um, so I, I, I can't say exactly uh, what the state will have available at that site. Um, I uh, my understanding is that it'll be PCR tests um, at least based on the the operation they're looking to set up. Can I just ask you then what with all due respect, I think rapid tests and the lack of them is is the biggest problem right now for everybody. What good will PCR tests do? When a person wants to find out, you know, if they're if they're positive or not, we know the PCR test will take at least forty eight hours. I would imagine. Well, uh, PCR testing still provides a lot of value. Um, individuals need a PCR result to, uh, in many times, uh, to travel, return to work, or meet other requirements. Um, we also know that PCR testing does have a slightly greater sensitivity um, for identifying cases. And for many people, that's the route that they wanna go. Um, it's true that there are cases where, where having a rapid test and a result immediately provides people more information. Um, but again, uh, when individuals are symptomatic with flu-like symptoms, um, 
whether they've had the test or not, we want them to isolate until they feel better. Um, so it's really, this should not be predicated on uh, specifically getting results back in 15 minutes or a day or two days later. If you're sick, you need to isolate. Um, but again, we, we do understand that, that the convenience of the rapid testing and distribution of that is something that's helping a lot of people out. And that's uh, the reason why we are pursuing that. Okay, and then the other question about the library locations. And did yeah, you say so, a couple of days? Yeah, so a couple of things I want to say. First off, I expect we'll have lines at both the PCR and rapid test pickup sites. I expect people want both. And so we're gonna make both available in greater quantity. It's just, you know, obviously if you mix and match, then you end up with, you know, with people in the wrong lines. And, and so we want to be very clear about some sites will offer PCR, some sites will offer rapid, and some sites might offer both. So that people have the option, people know what options are available to them at different times. For now, the libraries. Like, well, no, I'm saying across the county when we talk about sites, the libraries will be exclusively rapid test distribution, just so we're clear. Different sites in different parts of the county in different locations will offer different kinds of testing. The library specifically will offer rapid tests for the general public. Um, we the goal is um, to offer uh, rapid tests at most. Though there's a couple exceptions. There's actually one library that's closed right now. There's the noise library for kids, which is very small and uh, it isn't really conducive to to distribution. But we'd like to be able to offer it at all of the remaining branches. That said. We probably will not go from operating zero libraries to opening 19 sites on day one. It will likely be a distribution across the county and it will scale up over time as we have, because obviously we're right now in the background working on staffing schedules, making sure that the how the queuing of a line will work around each individual site, which is, set up, is, is different, where the tables will be. Uh, we're working on all the where we'll store the supplies at the library for the day you know right. day, like we're working all the logistics for each individual site right now and how so many do you goal, think oh how many do you think that you'll open then on day one i uh we'll be able to talk about that probably over the next day or so i don't i don't i'm not ready to, to announce what we'll be able to open on day one you know for example sure. if we're able to open three or four this saturday for example we're going to do it. we're not going to wait till we have we can open 10. We're going to try and get as many as we can open as quickly as possible with the goal to open 19 of the locations, generally speaking, by the by the full activation of this process. All right. And then do you have enough staff right now, sir? Because my understanding is there a staffing shortage that, uh, for this particular area that might hold you back from opening more than um, less? So we have had a great conversation with uh, McGeo, our employee union. We've actually had preliminary conversations with um, the IAFF and, and firefighters to to work on not just using librarians to staff the library distribution sites, utilizing potentially um, light duty fire rescue staff or using other other um, county employees who may be interested in you know you know offering some overtime because obviously this would be outside of work hours in some cases, offering some additional opportunities for employees to receive uh, extra hours to work and then uh, volunteering to work in these sites and so. I don't expect we're going to have a shortage of, of staff to do it. We also know that we have a wonderful volunteer network in our medical reserve corps and our uh, CERT team, community emergency response team programs, where people will often want to volunteer for things like this, where it's a it's a simple distribution that really benefits their communities. And so I expect through you know going through our normal staffing process and the use of our volunteers that we'll have we'll be able to build up to the staffing that we need. But obviously. We're trying to get this rolling as quickly as possible. We need to know information like how you know how much these boxes weigh and all these information that we've had to get over the last uh, last several days for the planning purposes. How much room do we need in the facilities to store? All those details, the, the logistic details of these distributions, are often the more challenging things in terms of uh, getting them up and running. And we wanted to make sure we had kits in hand to do it. So we'll have a lot more information, I think, over the next 24, maybe 48 hours. And be able to talk a lot more about how this will launch, where the sites will be, the hours for each location, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Real quick, last question, sir. This is these te tests for the library are coming from the 1.1 million that will be rolling in this week, correct? Correct. Thank you. I was muted. Okay, next up is Jack Moore, WTOP. Good afternoon, Jack. Good afternoon. Quick question on the CDC guidance. It's um, I, I hope I'm up to date, but it's, it's changing a lot. Um, it was my understanding that um, and it was kind of controversial to shorten the 
the uh, quarantine isolation period to five days and then continue to wear a mask for five additional days without a test, a rapid test coming out. Is it, um, so are you all going to, in the MCPS setting, are you going to require a rapid test um, after day five or will it be a recommendation, you know, like you should, but it's not required? So Jack, great question. So we're going to follow up and craft excuse me, our guidelines based on MSDE and MDH, our current policy recommendation will require tests on day five. As Dr. Stoddard indicated, we are putting a significant amount of rapid tests in the hands of MCPS. And so we need to have a conversation with MCPS after we, we receive the guidance from MSDE and MDH to see if that changes or enhances our recommendation. So that's pretty much where we are now as far as any additional recommendation or guidance to MCPS not only for K through 12 settings, but also in those child care settings as well. And generally, so generally speaking, I would just add that we, we view the, the rapid test as a necessary component at the back end of a quarantine process to really feel safe. There are a percentage of people who will, who are asymptomatic, but will still be infectious after day five. And particularly in settings where schools where we're particularly concerned about outbreaks as we're all discussing and looking at the data right now, we're not looking to make it Le more likely that we bring cases in the school and we think a rapid test on the back end of any setting is the best way to go. Now, whether we can accomplish it in, in MCPS or any other setting is a, is a discussion with the partners all involved. And I don't want to get ahead of that discussion. So even uh, if MS MSDE and um, MDH, if they just adopt the CBC guidance as is, but you all could still go, you know, a little more stringent with the rapid test? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, everybody. I do not see any more questions on the chat from reporters. One, one. Can I get a one more, Kate Ryan, just to follow up on what you said. Go ahead. Go ahead. What, what you said there is very important that you would like to see the rapid test. You'd like to require it. When can parents know? Because I know in DC, the issue was we didn't know. We can't get the tests in our hands. How do we get our kids back? When, when do you think you might be able to have these conversations and go, okay, here's the deal, parents? Okay, great question. As Dr. Stoddard indicated, we don't wanna get ahead to provide any uh, a narrative to parents right now. I have a meeting that's starting now, and then another meeting this evening with MCPS at 5.30. So once we review those recommendations, MCPS along with, uh, with our partners, uh, we'll share that information. That's pretty much where we are now. But I would say, Kate, Thank just you. on the on the rapid. I mean, obviously, this decision is made a lot easier by the fact that we are now starting to receive significant numbers of rapid tests that we can utilize for this or any other purpose. And so, many of the decisions being made across the country are being made in the setting of resource and availability. I think she, actually, uh, Dr. McKnight referred to this in her press briefing before yesterday yesterday morning when she talked about this. Is, Resource availability has driven a lot of decisions for MCPS, but every other organization across the country. And so now that we have increased resource availability for rapid tests uh, starting this week, um, I, I think a lot of what we, um, it, it, it can, it can uh, amplify some of the decisions that we make and make them more, um, not more stringent, but more protective. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kay. Any more follow-ups from the members of the media? Going once, going twice, we're done for today. Thank you everybody for joining us. Stay safe, have a great afternoon and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Hope you feel better, Mr. County Executive. <laughs>